I want to begin with a story of, my, of one, of my, one of my daughters. I have three daughters. My eldest daughter is, is Grace. She's five years of age. We have a son, Joseph, and then two twin daughters, Eden and Anna. I, I often get those two mixed up because they're, they're twins and they came out within eight minutes of each other and it's hard to remember the order, but Eden's slightly older. Uh, Grace was actually born here in the United States. I often say that we liked it so much here that we decided to have an American. Um, we were just so overwhelmed. We just wanted to increase your population. In fact, my secret goal is that one day she'll be president of the United States. <laughs> uh, controversial, I know, in these, uh, these days. <laughs> anyway, maybe she'd be a better candidate. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I'll st- steer away from politics. <laughs> steer away from politics. Anyway, a few years ago, we'd actually left the States. So Grace, Grace was one when we left. And we'd left, and, and we were just so deeply entrenched in culture shock back in the UK. Reverse culture shock, I think they call it. Uh, we just hated it. We did, the weather was grim and everything else, and so you know, people were miserable and you know, all that stuff. So we decided we, we wanted to come back out and spend some time back in our home. And we've been really keen that Gracie would have a sense of herself being an American. We think it's an important part of her life and her heritage. And so we wanted to bring her back as well. And at this point, she's about two years of age. And she's never really seen or re- really experienced, as somebody who can remember stuff, what it's like to be in California. So we were building it up for her. We were like, Gracie, it's amazing, California. The sun's fantastic. And there are these things in California. They're called beaches. <laughs> and she's like, are those the things with like sharp stones on? When you, when you walk, you fall over, and it's miserable, and it's cold, and it's wet. No, I said, no, those are British beaches. <laughs> They're different in California. Life is completely different in California. It's wonderful in California. So we told her that when she got to the beach, she'd be able to build a sandcastle. It would be wonderful. And so we took her that pretty much the first day on our trip here. We took her to our favorite beach, Crystal Cove Beach. There's a a restaurant there. Really why we like the beach is the restaurant. And so we used to hang out there a lot. And so we, as a kind of trip of nostalgia, we took her there. Now you park your car in the parking lot, Crystal Cove Beach. You have to walk down quite a long um, sort of walkway, asphalt walkway. Now I'd, you can, you know, get a, a bus down, but it costs like two dollars, so I'm cheap. I didn't want to do that. So we're walking down with little Gracie, and as you walk down, you reach the end of the asphalt, and you you're probably about 50 yards at this point from the beach. Yeah, you can almost you can smell the sea. You can smell the sea by this point. And as you're about 50 yards away, the restaurant's there on your right, and it's, the asphalt changes into this dusty path. Dust, really, sand dust on top of rock. Now, Gracie, as soon as we hit this path, drops to her knees, grabs her shovel and her bucket and starts trying to fill the bucket with the dust. She's never seen a beach before. She thinks this is a beach. She thinks this is all there is. We're just kind of, Gracie, no. There's more. If you just stand up, walk 50 yards, you can experience the fullness of the beach. All that the beach has to offer, you're kind of on your knees, rubbing your knees in this rocky sand, this dusty rock. But there is more for you. There are millions and millions upon millions of grains of sand 50 yards down. If only you would walk that way. And as I've been thinking about that story, and it's something that Amy and I have talked about a number of times, I thought it's actually not a bad parable, is it, for the Christian life? Many of us have that experience at different times in our faith. A feeling like we're not experiencing the fullness of all that God would have for us. It's as if we're like Gracie, like kneeling down, trying to dig our best, give it our best effort to make this work. The sense I have, what I want to speak about this morning is the fact that there is, in fact, more for us. There is always more. We can say that with confidence theologically because God is infinite. We can never exhaust the riches, the the wonderful riches of his grace poured out for us, given to us in Christ Jesus. We can never get to the end of the greatness, the grandeur of God, the goodness of his love, the blessings of his favor, the riches of his friendship and his kindness. 
We can't reach the end. You know that old song? I don't know if you sang it here. Jesus' love is very wonderful. You know that one? No? Kids' song? Started a bit high, didn't I? Yeah. I'm going to carry on. So high, can't get over it, so low. Join in with me if you know it. Can't get under it, so wide, can't get round it. Oh, wonderful love. Oh, wonderful love. There you go. That's the song. You can't get round it. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. It's, it's too big. So high. There's always more of God. There's always more to be experienced. But sometimes we don't experience the fullness. Last week we talked about one way of looking at relationship with God, of it, even the, the whole history of the cosmos, as being God's invitation to friendship. And that through Christ Jesus, God has, has made right what was made wrong in the garden and has offered us freedom and friendship in Christ Jesus. We said that that was characterized by his favor. That is, his friends were invited into receiving his favor, knowing his favor, that he truly is for us. That we can experience intimacy with God. And that we can truly experience freedom in God. Freedom, in fact, to be drawn into his purposes, to become the kind of people that he intended we would always be. We also talked about the obstacles that we experience, guilt, fear, and shame, and how they turn us in on ourselves. Rather than being called, turn up to God in worship, guilt, fear, and shame, the consequences of sin turn us into ourselves. And therefore, we don't experience the fullness of the life that is truly life. Now, Jesus says, we looked at this last week in John chapter 15. Jesus says we're called to be his friends, but just before he does that, in verse 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. What I want to talk about more this morning is that connection, that intimate link between experiencing the fullness of life in Christ Jesus, which looks like friendship, which looks like Favor, intimacy, and freedom, and doing what he's commanded. In other words, a life of faith, a life of risk. And what I want to suggest is that as we step into risk, so we experience the freedom, the blessing, the favor of his friendship. But there are obstacles. Those obstacles are fear, guilt, and shame. The obstacles are sin. That's the obstacle, of course, the simple obstacle to his experiencing his life. There's an Anglican confession. Now, I'm just going to front up with you right now because I don't want us to go too far in our relationship without you knowing this. I'm Anglican. I was just ordained. It's just a confession. There you go. <laughs> That's the family into which I've just been sort of joined. And there's this beautiful confession. You know, when we come together as God's people, before we take communion, we'd say these words. And we'd confess that we've sinned, and these three things, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. Isn't that great? <laughs> through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. And as I look back on my life and my struggles to experience the life that's truly life, in my own experience, I find that any one of those three at any given time, sometimes all three at the same time, are operating for me. Ignorance, weakness, our own deliberate fault. They're the things that stop us from experiencing the life that's truly life. Stepping out in faith, they stop us. And actually, as we look at the scriptures, we find we're not alone. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, have always struggled in these ways. John chapter 20, if you want to open your Bible, feel free to do that. Again, John is the fourth book in the New Testament, the fourth story, probably, well, in terms of how it's arranged in the Bible, probably in terms of when it was written as well. But in John chapter 20, about five chapters on from where we were last week, as we looked at what it means to be a friend of Jesus, Jesus appears to his disciples. I, I just want to use this as an example of what it means to live in ignorance, weakness, and our own deliberate fault. And he appears to the disciples, and, and poor Thomas, poor Thomas isn't there. You know, doubting Thomas is an unfortunate name. And Thomas is missing. Verse 19, is what, this is what we read. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. By the way, that is what you'd need to hear. If you were in their situation, what you'd need more than anything else is peace. This is what Jesus wants to bring. 
to his people. This is what it means for him to to bless his people with his presence, is to offer his peace. Verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, here's their commission, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus. Now, if my name was Thomas or Didymus, I'd also choose Thomas. It's a much better name. (laughs) Apologies to anyone called Didymus here. One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is like, yeah, right. But essentially, that's a paraphrase. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas, poor Thomas didn't get the invite. Maybe he had a calendar clash, a scheduling conflict. You know, Thomas was down the pub with his mates or having a coffee down at Starbucks, whatever it was back then he was doing. He was doing something else. Maybe too much prayer, he just tapped out. He's like, I just need a break. He went somewhere else. Jesus shows up. He missed it. And Thomas does probably what most of us would do. And probably what all of those disciples would have done as well. He doesn't believe. He can't see. He can't really understand. It's all too big for him. Ignorance. He misses it because of ignorance. I mean, any one of those disciples were out of that room at that time. I'm sure they'd have responded in a similar way. Sometimes we miss the life that's truly alive. We can miss out as well. Because of our ignorance, because we don't really understand the life that God is calling us to. Maybe nobody showed us. Maybe it was never explained to us. We just we can miss it. We think that the sand, we think that there's no such thing as a beach. We think it's all pebbles or it's all rocky, dusty land. Thomas is an example for us of that ignorance, but it's not always ignorance. Maybe it's weakness. Thomas clearly has some kind of weakness in his outlook, or you might say his worldview. Thomas is, I think, the first materialist. Materialist is someone that says all that is has to be, all that is real must be seen or, or gathered through some, one of the senses. In other words, if it's real, I've got to touch it. I've got to smell it. I've got to see it. I've got to hear it. And if it's not, I don't believe it's real. Thomas is really a materialist. There's a, there's a, there's a missing piece in his worldview. He's kind of trading on a misconception of reality. Problem with Thomas's attitude, he thinks that experience comes before faith. That can be true, but often it's the reverse. Faith leads to a greater experience. Thomas wants a new experience, but in order to get a new experience of God, He needs to, and we need to find a greater obedience to God. It's the obedience that leads into, oftentimes for us, a greater experience. He's weakened in his worldview. He's weakened in his faith as well. He just can't, he can't even believe in a world where things like resurrection happen. (laughs) Maybe you're in that situation right now. Maybe in your life, in your relationships, in your marriage, in your friendships, in your work situation, or in your church life, maybe your own spiritual life, it just feels like there's deadness. It just feels like there's barrenness. You know, we sing that song earlier, you never run dry, you never run dry, and you, do, you feel like you're in the wilderness. You can't believe those words. Your experience has, has weakened you. We all go through those times. The Spirit of God wants to provide strength to you this morning. He wants to comfort you. He is the comforter, the counselor, the one who comes alongside to join with us, to give us Jesus' power. Obedience leads to greater experience. I'm going to tell you a story about a, my, my cousin uh, who leads a church with his wife, who's Amy's sister. That's all very confused. It's all legal. I... I <laughs> I assure you, it's, it's legal, so at least in the UK, it's legal. <laughs> and um, they lead a church, and, and they were kind of, one Sunday, probably about three or four weeks ago, giving this 
impassioned charge to the church saying, hey guys, come on. This week, if you hear the Spirit of God saying something to you, go for it, risk for it. Encourage you, I challenge you to do that. And doing probably what pastors all over the country do when they do that sort of thing. They're please, Lord. Like crossing the fingers and praying their best prayers at the same time. Please, Lord, show up for our church. And then this guy, uh, whose name was Sam, was in a park, and he just thought he'd test this all out. He felt like, while he was walking in this park, he just felt like the Spirit of God said to him, hey, go to that coffee shop. So he's in the park, he goes to the coffee shop, he sits down. And as he's sitting down, a guy walks past him, and as this guy walks past him, Sam just, this name drops into his head. And he's not particularly familiar with doing ministry or doing stuff like this, but he's just kind of willing to to check it out. So this name, Daniel, comes into his mind. And so in that moment, Sam's like, wow, that's interesting. Daniel, I don't know. What should I do? This guy's just walked past. Daniel, I don't know. And he does probably what I would have done. He buries it. (laughs) Just like, I think any more than that, Lord. Um, I don't know about you, but in those moments where I think God's speaking, what happens to me is the blood immediately just leaves my head. (laughs) And most of the top half of my body. And then I just start... It's all just like there, you know? And probably Sam's experiencing that, and he hears Daniel, but it's, it's just not enough. Anyway, this guy walks off, and, and then Sam, as he's sitting there, gets this kind of vision in his mind. And there's a man in the middle of the vision, Daniel, and there are lions prowling around him. And in that moment, he's like, oh my gosh, I, I think I've got to say something. By, the, by now, this guy's like, well, I don't know, 100 yards away or something. So he gets up out of his seat, and now he's really, now he has to, you know, his disobedience leads him to embarrassment here. He stands up and he shouts, Dan! Daniel, his first name terms, Daniel, Dan! Runs up to this guy, this guy just ignores him. He gets up to this guy, blowing. He stands by this guy and says, look, this is really weird. But as I was sitting down, is your name Daniel? And the guy goes, no. (laughs) And uh, so Sam says, oh. <laughs> but now he's kind of knee deep, isn't he? Like he's, he may as well wade all the way in. So he says, well, your name's not Daniel, so I'm zero for one. But let's just try this. I got a picture in my mind. I believe God is real. I believe he speaks. And I got a picture of a man called Daniel. And lions were prowling around him. And there was just death around him. This guy's jaw drops to the floor. <laughs> my name is Daniel. He says, now admits it, my name is Daniel. And I've been walking around this park because I've been uh, preparing to commit suicide. Sam heard, he obeyed, he believed that this simple, simple thing might be of God. And God used it, he stepped in. He extended friendship to this guy, Daniel. The incredible thing, and they then began to talk. And two hours later, he led him to the Lord. Oh no, he'd have done well not to lead him to the Lord after that, I think. <laughs> like, he'd have to be pretty ineffective not to get him into the kingdom. The next day, he took, um, he took Daniel to an a Alpha, an Alpha weekend. Alpha's this thing that I think you're going to be beginning as a church in the next few weeks. And there's this weekend as part of it where we begin to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And this guy, uh, Daniel, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he, and he shared next week, the next Sunday he shared with the church what had happened. And he said, look, I, everything's changed for me. I've come alive. I feel alive. I've never felt alive before. All because Sam took a risk. Amazing. Sometimes, though, we miss that life of the kingdom because of weakness, ignorance, weakness, sometimes our own deliberate fault. Maybe our apathy. Maybe we're just too dang comfortable. You answer my phone, love. Maybe we're just too comfortable. Maybe it's just too easy. Maybe we've crafted ourselves too comfortable across, too comfortable a life. And so we miss out on the fullness that Jesus might have for us. Ignorance, weakness, our own deliberate fault. But there is more, church. There's more for you. There's more. There's a, there's a better experience of life through the Spirit, a fuller, a richer experience of life. Now, I don't just mean the good stuff, by the way. When Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly, he means full life, kingdom life. And sometimes that means suffering. 
Sometimes that means difficulty. Sometimes that means the heartache, the grief. It's the fullness of life. It's life. It's every part of life. But every part of life with Jesus. The fullness of life, the kingdom life. Jesus has that for us. And thanks be to God, he promises to lead us into that life. What do you say in Luke chapter 12? Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Church, God's pleasure, God's desire for you is the experience of the kingdom. Nothing less than the kingdom. So what does that look like? In the last 10 minutes, I want to paint a picture of what the kingdom is all about. And it begins in Mark. Well, it begins a long time ago, but I want to begin in Mark's gospel. Second gospel in the New Testament. And, and what we read is about Jesus as he shows up on the scene is this in verse 14 of Mark's gospel. Mark 1.14. After John was put in prison... John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for Jesus, who's kind of completing Israel's story before Jesus shows up on the scene. John was put in prison. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news, gospel, the announcement, the heralding of this piece of good news that changes the order of all reality, the good news of God. And what is the good news? The good news is this, the time has come. Let's paraphrase that. The waiting is over. The waiting is over. The time has come. The time is fulfilled. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Such a short section here, but there's so much in here. The time has come. Well, time has come for what? Well, if you were somebody that heard this in the first century. You were an Israelite. You knew what it was to wait. In fact, you'd been waiting hundreds of years. You'd been waiting 400 years since the last prophet showed up and said anything whatsoever. What were you waiting for? You were waiting for deliverance, for rescue, for salvation. Because Israel's understanding of herself, the nation of Israel, God's people, was that she was still in exile. She was still oppressed. Even though she was back in the land that God had sworn and promised to her to have. Rome was this, this latest nation in a succession of nations to oppress the people of Israel. And they were crying out and waiting and hoping, expecting and acting in order to bring about God's kingdom, the arrival of God's king, who they knew would come and deliver them from this oppression. He'd come and save them. And for them, that probably the interpretation of that would be that he'd overthrow the Roman oppressors and deliver them into the life, the kingdom life, the life that they knew God had for them, shalom, a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of God's rulership, a life of abundance, a life of blessing, where Israel would rule the nations under Israel's rightful king, the Messiah. Israel was waiting for that king. They were waiting. So Jesus shows up and says this, the time has come, the waiting is over, the kingdom of God is available, it's at hand. You can reach out and touch it. Now is the time. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's incredible, right? I mean, there are these moments in our history as well, where not obviously as big as this, but where we experience like somebody offering completion. Now, in my country, I said I wouldn't go into politics again, I lied. In 1997, the Labour Party um, swept to power a landslide victory, Tony Blair, who you've no doubt heard of. He, he took power, and it was, it was this moment, I can't, I can't describe it, that it was a really hot summer, which is like one in a million, so that was part of it. The year before, we'd done actually quite well at soccer in a tournament. That never happens either. And there was like all these things came together, and there was this message of hope. Blair carried with him this message that things could be different. We'd just come out of recession, just a new hope. I was here in 2008, and Obama again offered that same sense of hope, didn't he? It was, it was messianic. And there was a tangible sense in my country in 97 of like, Things are going to be different. <laughs> you remember when Prince, you, Prince George was born? I don't know if you, you covered, that was covered here. Probably fans of Downton are like, yeah, all right, I remember that. <laughs> but there was a huge thing. People camped out the, you know, the nights before outside the hospital just to await the arrival of the king or the future king. 
It's that sort of thing happening here. There's great expectation, but times a million. Waiting nine months is nothing like waiting 400 years or a couple thousand years. Jesus arrives. He's offering a new reality in which people might experience fullness of life. What does it look like? What's the kingdom about? Well, it's about following Jesus. Why? Because the next thing Jesus does is to call disciples. It's about deliverance from demonic oppression. Why? Because the next thing he does after that is to, is to cast out a demon, to take power over the demonic forces. It's about healing because the thing after he does that is to, is to go heal Peter's mother-in-law. It's about prayer. It's about new intimacy with the Father. Jesus then goes to pray. It's about healing of, of social, for social outcasts. It's about bringing them in because he then goes to heal a leprous person. It's about forgiveness of sins. It's about drawing us into the, the heart of God again. This is, this is what the kingdom's about. Now, for the Israelites, it was easy for them to miss Jesus because they'd expected somebody who was going to overcome military oppression coercion and the only way to overcome violence surely is, fit, is to bring more violence yet yeah, Jesus has got his eyes trained on another enemy the original enemy he's come after a different kingdom the kingdom of darkness the kingdom that truly oppresses us all the kingdom that quashes and squelches life within us Jesus has come after Satan and he overcomes the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, on the cross. <laughs> Riding into Jerusalem, not on a horse, with an army, on a donkey, in the back door, with a ragtag group of disciples. An upside down kingdom. But a kingdom that we've all been invited to share in today. A kingdom of peace, a kingdom of shalom, a kingdom of the presence of God, a kingdom of forgiveness, a kingdom where there's a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance, a kingdom where no relationship is too far gone, where God might not bring about his reconciliation, a kingdom where no situation is so hopeless that God could not come in, a kingdom where no sickness and no suffering is, not, is, is, too, is too deep, is too messy for God to climb down into it in the person of Jesus and share in it with you, a kingdom of life, a kingdom of friendship, a kingdom of favor and blessing, a kingdom of the cross and the resurrection. This is the life, church. And we play our part. We experience that. We step into that by risking our all for that. <laughs> we don't tiptoe away into that kingdom. Greater love hath no man than this, then he'd lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. It's, a, it's an entering in through risk, through abandonment, through surrender. What would it look like for us to live that surrender? What would our response be to that kind of kingdom? Jesus offers us those words, repent and believe the good news. Now, we've been trained to think repentance is about confession. Now, I'm not saying repentance is entirely divorced from confession. Sometimes when we repent, we have to do some confessing. <laughs> Always, in fact. But it's more than just confession. Repentance is actually about a total reordering of all of your reality on the basis of a new truth. Repentance, true repentance is about completely reordering everything that counts. You know, when I married Amy, I had to repent. <laughs> I had to reorder my life. I couldn't, I couldn't do the things that I did before. I couldn't watch football all day on Saturday. I couldn't do it. I, I would have liked to, if I'm honest. Shut your ears, love. But I had to change my way of thinking. And I had to change my way of behaving. Because I was stepping into a new identity and a new reality. I had responsibilities. This was quadrupled a thousand times the case when we had a child. <laughs> and when we had twins, let me tell you, that repentance almost killed me. <laughs> I had nothing left to repent of. There was nothing left to repent. I was just dead. 
So you've got to reorder life if you want to step into a new life. That's what the kingdom demands of us. The kingdom demands that we offer everything to Jesus and say, you, all right, here it is. You, you do it then. You build it. <laughs> Repent and believe. What might this look like for you? Well, we need to ask God to establish his kingdom in us. We need to ask, and we begins with prayer. We pray, Jesus, this sounds good. Please, please. We, we, we offer him our prayers. We offer him our brokenness. We offer him our honesty. And we say, Jesus, you could do something with a mess like this. You've done it before. You did it with Lazarus. I might be, I'm a Lazarus case, but you've done that. You've got a good track record. Do it with me, Jesus. We ask him. We open ourselves. We pray for a new imagination, a new kingdom imagination. We pray for new kingdom power, a new vision for our own lives and for our city, for our own relationships. And then we risk, we hear and obey. Blessed, Jesus said, are those who hear and obey. We hear him say, get connected at church. And we say, all right, I'll take that risk. We hear him say, forgive that person. And we say, all right, Lord. It doesn't feel like the right thing to do. <laughs> but because you say so, I'll do it. We hear him say, reconcile yourself with that person. We say, well, they've wronged me. And he says, reconcile yourself with that person. We do it. We hear him say, speak to that person about me. Take that job. Refuse that job so you can stay in the place I've called you. Whatever it is, it's a million different things for a million different people. But we hear and obey and we risk. And as we risk, we see his kingdom come. We experience his intimacy. What would a church look like who were committed to this risk, this life of the kingdom, what could a city look like if an army of disciples like you stepped into greater risk?